And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your heads be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. Verse 25. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifice and burnt offering, mm -hmm. that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. They shall not and of be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. Mm -hmm. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come either. 27. But the Lord adding various art, and he would not let them go. Verse 28. Yeah. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me. Take it to thyself. See my face no more. Mm -hmm. For in that day thou shalt die. Thou shalt die. Verse 29, which is the last verse. Yeah. And Moses said, Thou art spoken well. I will see thy face again no mm -hmm. more. Praise the name of the Lord. So you see, that scripture is talking about when the children of Israel were set free from captivity in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh, had, he had, his heart had been hardened. He had refused continuously. That was after they lost all their firstborn. And out of frustration, you know, out of all the pains that they had gone through, he said, let them go. In fact, when he said to them, go, he now said, no, leave all the cattle. And Moses said, no, we have to take everything. And he said, finally, he was forced to let them go. I will know the story that even when they had gone, he changed his mind and began to pursue again. Amen? So, upon Mount Zion, no matter how stubborn the enemy thinks he is, you know, there are some enemies that are very stubborn. Amen? They are stubborn, they don't let you go. That's why you see that people, you hear what they call generational causes. Those are enemies that have been moving from generation to generation in a family lineage. It affects the grandfather, the father, the son, the grandson. And it keeps going down. Why? Because it is stubborn and it is taking it as his right. That this captive belongs to me. No matter how strong the enemy may be, when it comes to Mount Zion, violently, they will be yanked off. Whether they like it or not. Just like what happened here to the children of Israel. Pharaoh, whether he liked it or not, those children of Israel, they must go. He himself won't put a curse that, get out of my face. If you see me again, you won't leave. And that was the truth. Because when he went and pursued Moses, he saw Moses again. He didn't leave. He died. He thought Moses would die, but he was the one that died. Why? Because there was a violent power of God that no enemy can resist. And you find that on Mount Zion. So when God locates you on your Mount Zion, no matter the forces of darkness that have been chasing you, running after you, pursuing you, or doing all manner of havoc in your life, it will come to an end. And I pray that will be your experience even in this season in the mighty name of Jesus. Another thing that you find on Mount Zion, number three now, you possess your inheritance. Amen? Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. It tells us that we are children of Jesus, of God. And then, not only are we children, we are heirs. Then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Amen? If indeed we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. Amen? This is one of the promises that we get when we follow Christ. We begin to possess our inheritance in Christ. That's why the Bible says that upon Mount Zion, you will possess your possessions. What are those possessions? These are the inheritance in Christ Jesus. Things that you and I inherit because we are joint heirs with Christ. We inherit them. Amen? You, might, you, you know, it's 
over and above labor is something that you inherit because you have been adopted as a son. So, your father's wealth is transferred to you as an inheritance. Your father's joy is transferred to you as an inheritance. Your father's healing is transferred to you as an inheritance. Amen? There are so many inheritances in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Amen? We inherit the riches of Christ Jesus. His poverty or our poverty is exchange with his riches. So, one thing that you must know, once you are upon Mount Zion, the poverty that you have been suffering, whether it's from generation to generation, it doesn't matter. Once you are on Mount Zion, you begin to exchange your poverty with the riches of Christ Jesus. He takes it from you and gives you his riches. Amen? What do you inherit again? You, and you inherit healing. Isaiah 53, verse 5. You know, Jesus was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. Sickness is a killer. Sickness is a devourer. Sickness will put you in one spot. Sickness will destroy. Sickness frustrates. Sickness takes away your resources. There's nothing good in sickness. Nothing. You can't find anything that's good. Nothing. But when you are Mount Zion, what happens? You are relieved of all the sickness because by his stripes, you are healed. So your sickness is taken away and health is given to you. You also enjoy divine assistance as an inheritance of Christ. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 10 to 13. Amen. You enjoy divine inheritance because God promises you that you will never be alone. He says to you, fear not. Do not be dismayed. I will not forsake you. I won't leave you alone. I am there with you. I will help you. It's a promise. You enjoy all of this upon Mount Zion. Another thing you enjoy as an inheritance, possessing your inheritance, is that you overcome death. You overcome death. Because as a joint heir with Christ Jesus, that is one of the privileges that we enjoy. You overcome death. Why? Because Christ has taken the keys of death. Therefore, death no longer has dominion over you. You overcome death, whether it be spiritual death, whether it be financial death, whether it be physical, whether it be material, whether it be in your destiny, whatever, in your business, all death, you, are, you overcome them. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. You overcome death. These are just few. There are so many, so many, so many that we enjoy. We begin to possess our inheritance in Christ. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. What do we find upon Mount Zion? Quickly, just take maybe two more. Yeah, maybe we can take two or three more. Number four, manifestation of fruitfulness and multiplication. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. Genesis 1 28. What do you find? Manifestations of fruitfulness and multiplication. In the beginning, originally, man was made to be blessed. As soon as man was made, he got the blessing of fruitfulness, multiplication, and dominion. But this blessing was lost on account of sin. We lost it. Man lost it. And many people are still striving, toiling, grinding. And there are no signs of fruitfulness, no sign of multiplication, talk less of dominion. There is no way you can even talk about dominion if there's no multiplication, if there's no fruitfulness. But when you come to your Mount Zion, that original plan that God had, the original blueprint, uh, blueprint, what God intended for man is restored upon you. Such that you will just discover that little efforts they are producing. Little efforts. Which is 
with his little effort they are producing, you find out that there's a kind of favor upon you that anything you touch, it will work out well. It's because you're upon Mount Zion. Because the enemy cannot reach you anymore. So the favor and the joy, the greatness that leads to multiplication and fruitfulness will be expressed. Amen? This is God's original plan and you'll find it upon Mount Zion. Quickly, number five. What do you find in Mount Zion? Upon Mount Zion, there is fullness of joy. Psalm 16, verse 11. There's fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. One of the things that you must enjoy on Mount Zion is fullness of joy. You must be joyous. Sometimes, check it. You might just wake up, you are sorrowful. What's wrong? You don't know. Something heavy is upon you. You are not just happy. Amen? Or you just receive a news that is not pleasant and you get overwhelmed in sorrow. But upon Mount Zion, no matter what is happening around, inside of you, because joy is coming, is from the is, is a fruit of the Spirit. It's from the Holy Spirit. No circumstance can kill it. You are always joyous. You are always radiating joy. And that is part of what makes... You see, part of what makes people sick is sorrow. Because when you are sorrowful, it affects your blood. It affects the bone marrow. And all manner of sickness begin to come out from a heart that is filled with sorrow. But when you are filled with joy, you think clearly. You see clearly. Your mind is at peace. You, don't, you are not worried. You are not tense. You are not anxious. Amen? You are able to praise God from your heart. You are able to serve God. You are able to see things from the perspective of what the scripture says. And you will find out that joy will fill your heart joy. There's fullness of joy. The Bible even tells us that until now you have asked nothing. Ask that your joy may be full. Amen? Because joy is a situation where there is no anxiety. Everything is working together for what? For your good. I pray that will be your experience this month and beyond and forever in the mighty name of Jesus. Finally, we just take the last one that I put down. What do you find upon Mount Zion? Peculiarities. Number six now. A place of answer to prayers. A place of answer to prayers. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. God says, Call to me, and I will answer. Call to me, and I will answer. Amen. Ordinary us, human being to human being, if you pick up your mobile phone and you are calling your wife or your husband or your uncle or your auntie or your friend and the phone is ringing and ringing and it's not picking, after a while you begin to become nervous. <laughs> Am I communicating this? After a while you begin to be nervous. Before you know, you begin to get angry. Why are you not picking up a call? Then maybe after you've tried and tried and tried, the best that picks, you say, I've been calling you since. Why don't you take your call? All what you want to say, you have put it on the backside. You are angry because when you are calling, there is no answer. There is nothing more frustrating than when you pray, there's no answer. Because what it tells you is that, ah, has God neglected me? Amen? Just Husband to wife, friend to friend, amen. Uh, uh, HOD to just ordinary human being. You are calling the person, the person is not picking your call. You get angry. Am I lying? Because it sends a signal to you that is it that they have rejected me, or I'm no more important, or this person has just pushed me to a corner, amen. Talk less of your heavenly father when you pray. You don't get an answer. But on Mount Zion, as soon as you are, before you are yet speaking, God is answering you. Amen? He says, call to me 
a promise. Call to me. I will answer. Not only is he promising you that he will answer. He is telling you, I will show you great and mighty things that you don't even know. Great and mighty things that you don't know. That's why we will go back to pray again. You think prayer is a, is a tax? No. Prayer is enjoyable when God answers. When God answers your prayer, it doesn't answer alone. It shows you things that you don't know. Things that are great and mighty for your benefit, for your advancement, for your deliverance, for your protection, for your greatness. So when you pray today, nobody tells you to go back tomorrow to pray. Why? Because he keeps answering you and he keeps showing you. But you can only find this in Mount Zion. You will find it when you're in Mount Zion. You pray and you get answer. Some of us have been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and it's like it's voicemail. Like somebody, there's some people say, oh, your prayer will not go to voicemail. Because when your prayer goes to voicemail, that means there's no answer. And it is frustrating. I pray that God will answer your prayers this season. Not only we answer your prayers, it will show you greater mighty things, which you don't even know in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Now we are moving forward. Amen. We are going to the second outline, which is conditions to be established upon Mount Zion. You see, Mount Zion is a place that there is no body that will not desire to be there. A place where you find God's presence. A place where you will get all your inheritance. A place where God will violently deliver you from every form of bondage and darkness and things that have been pulling you down like what we described before. A place where God answers your prayers. A place where you find fullness of joy. Amen? There is no one that will not love to be upon Mount Zion. So Mount Zion is desirable for every one of us. However, what are the conditions to get there? Because it's not just free for all. There are certain things that must be done for you to be upon Mount Zion. In the scripture we read, our anchor scripture, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17. As soon as he said, upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. Right? The next thing he said, and there shall be what? Holiness. That's the condition. There shall be what? Ah, say it now. There shall be what? Holiness. There shall be what? Holiness. Now, what is Holiness. What is holiness? Some of us we privileged to be in the workers' meeting on Sunday and we heard a bit about holiness. So holiness is not a woman does not wear a earring. The people that don't wear a ring, there's nothing wrong with them. But that's not holiness. Amen. So you cannot say, oh, if when you want to describe holiness, is all those people that don't put on earrings. Or Holiness is women that don't wear weaver. Or they don't do their hair long. Or men that don't, don't wear uh, what, which was the fashion thing, you know. Maybe wristwatch or rings. That's not holiness. Amen? Those are not holiness. Holiness simply means obedience to the word of God. That's not holiness. Holiness. You must obey what God is telling you. That's just the meaning of holiness. If you can obey God today, obey God every blessed day, then you are holy. Are you following the of man? You are holy. Amen? So the condition for you to enjoy everything upon Mount Zion, he says, upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. Because as soon as you get there, deliverance must take place. Then, there is holiness. It's after the holiness, obedience to what God says, that's when you begin to possess your possessions. All those things we talked about. Possessing your possession. All the joy. The inheritance in Christ. The fullness of joy. Answer to prayers. God's almighty presence. Deliverance from oppression. All of those things will only come 
when you obey the word of God, holiness. So, what are the conditions? To so just list them out. Number one, there must be holiness. Number one, holiness. Amen? And you can replace it by saying, you must obey God. Because when you say holiness, everybody will say, oh, it's only that the child that's holy. Ah, God knows that. Huh. This generation, you cannot be holy. If not, you can't make it. Amen? So, you can replace it with obeying the word of God. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. It says, Who shall ascend into the hills of the Lord or his holy place? Those with a clean hand and pure hearts. Holiness. Without holiness, it's going to be difficult for you to ascend into Mount Zion. You cannot. Amen? You cannot. But there's grace for you to change your ways and to repent. Number two, what are the conditions that you need to enter into Mount Zion? Submission to his will. That's what we're talking about, obedience to God. Because there are things that God is going to tell you that you will need to submit to. Submission to his will. You must submit to God's will. Everybody has a plan for himself. Everybody has a desire. Everybody has need. But when you compare what you want to what God wants, you must submit yourself to what God wants. Are you following? Submission. Submission is one of the most difficult things when it comes to working with God. Because you must submit to what God wants and not to what you want. Two different things. What you want, there might be nothing wrong with it. But you must submit to what God wants. Amen? You must humble yourself. You must bring yourself down. You must comport yourself and submit to his will. I pray that God, Holy Spirit, will enlarge this word in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Number three condition. I just put three because of our time. Amen? Number three condition is that you must be ready to work hard, diligently. Otherwise, your talent will be taken away from you. Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Matthew 25, 14 to 30. It's a parable of the talents. Jesus is the one who told the story. Three different sort of people. The first one had five talents. Second one had two talents. And the last one had just one. And he gave them go and trade, multiply these talents. The one that had five, doubled it. The one that had two, also doubled it. But the one that had one did nothing with it. And what was the outcome? Did it was uh, what's the word to use now? The one that had one talent that did not double it, he was castigated, he was rebuked. Not only was he rebuked, he was also rejected. Not only was he rejected, they took the one talent from him and gave it to the one that had five. That tells you that when you are on your Mount Zion, it's not a place for you to go and sit down, cross your leg, I have arrived. Oh, therefore, everything is rosy now. I'm not going to do anything anymore. God is going to take care of me now. I'm just going to be sleeping and waking up. After all, it's a place of joy. It's a place where God will answer my prayer. I'll just be praying. I'll have miracle alert. Money will be entering my account. You know, everything will be working around. That is not how it is. You must be ready to work hard. Diligently. Maximizing your potentials. Otherwise, you'll be rejected. Because the one that had one talent, he didn't understand it. He had his one talent, did nothing with it. Some of us, we have talents. And we are not using to do anything. I say, no, I'm waiting for so and so. I'm waiting for the right time. There's no right time. Now, now, now is the right time. Now. Amen? Because if you don't maximize your talent, you don't produce results, what's going to happen? They will take your one talent from you. After you have been rejected, castigated, thrown out, they will give it to the one that is fruitful. Because upon Mount Zion, 
there must be fruitfulness. There is no room for stagnancy. There is no room for mediocrity. Amen? So, you must understand that when you get to this place, that's why I put it as the last point, so we can expand it on it a little bit. When you get to your Mount Zion, you are going to find out that it's a place of joy. It's a place where God answers prayers. It's a place where God's presence is mighty. It's a place where stagnancy, frustration is taken away because it's a place of deliverance. But it's also a place where you must work hard. You must be diligent. And you must maximize every of your talents that God has given to you. And I pray that this will be your testimony in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. So, in conclusion, your Mount Zion is a place of overflowing joy that God had prepared for you through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's a place where God has prepared for you through the power of Jesus Christ. There are many benefits, so numerous, that you will do well to embrace this beautiful Mount Zion. But to do so, you must come to the blood. The blood of Jesus must speak for you. The blood must cleanse you. The blood must wash you. Because that is the vehicle through which you will ascend to the hills, to your Mount Zion. If you don't come through the blood, you are going to be in the same place where there's frustration, where there's no rewards, where there's limited growth, where there's failure, regrets, pain, shame, sorrow, just name it. All manner of evil. You remain there. But the blood can take you out of that place. And how do you get this blood? Are you going to look for Jesus? Oh, give me a cup of your blood. Let me drink it. No. It's by faith. It's by faith. It's by faith. You will believe in your heart that he died on the cross for you. Sharing his blood for your sake. Then you will confess it with your mouth. Oh Lord, you are now my savior. And when you do so, all things we passed away. And behold, all things will become new. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. So, tonight, before we go into our next section of questions, answers, discussion, and all of that, we just want to give an opportunity for maybe one or two people, either you are with us right here in the church, or you are watching us online, and you want to come out of the angle of pain and frustration. And you want to ascend to a Mount Zion, a place of joy, a place of goodness, a place of favor, a place of promotion, multiplication, fruitfulness, a place of dominion, a place of answered prayer, a place where God's presence is mighty, a place where you will be delivered from all forms of bondage and darkness. And you want to say, Father, save me tonight. If you're that fellow, while we are buying our heads, I want you to probably signify, maybe lift up your hand, so I can pray with you. Amen? Because, you see, this life that we live in, every man <laughs> for himself, but God for us all. You have to make that decision by yourself. Amen? You have to say, God, I am tired of this place that I am. And I want to come to my Mount Zion. I want to ascend. I want to move to a level of joy and greatness. I want to come out of frustration, failures, and defeat. And I want the hand of God to carry me. Yes. You are saying that prayer, or you want to say that prayer, it is you that we are waiting for. Yes, anyone like that? Say, oh, Father, I'm surrendering my life to you. I come just as I am and I want you to save my soul. Probably you are watching us online. Prayer, very simple. Like I said already, you confess with your heart, with your mouth. Amen. You believe in your heart that Jesus died for you. 
and you confess with your mouth. So you say in prayer, Father, I believe in my heart that you died for me. And tonight, I'm confessing you as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me for all my sins and wash me clean in your blood. Cleanse me from every form of failure, every form of retrogression, anything that is not of God in my life. Cleanse it out of my life and please establish me on Mount Zion. Let my life begin to make progress. Let it become fruitful. Let it begin to multiply. Let your favor come upon me and let me begin to enjoy all round dominion. And if you pray that prayer, I want to congratulate you and welcome you to the family of God. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Amen.